Professor Standard, uh, first let me say uh, how honored we are, who, all of us who are working on this interview series. We've interviewed now uh, over 20 scholars from all over the world. And it, it is just a great honor to interview you in particular. Um, I, I'll provide a very brief introduction, which is, seems a bit um, unnecessary because everyone in this field will know who Nicholas Standard is. But uh, it, it is our custom to offer a few introductory remarks. Um, the first thing I want to say, really, is that of all the scholars uh, I personally know of in the field of China Christianity studies, you are the most published. And uh, there's probably not a single book in our field that does not either mention your work or cite your work. And you're also, you know, in the field, many scholars refer to uh, you as one of the leaders of the so-called Leuven School of Sino-Christian Studies. And uh, the, the so-called Leuven School is so honored and respected, uh, largely because of its deep commitment to looking at texts, original texts. And um, I know there are too many works to mention, but I should mention uh, maybe two. One is your, uh, your handbook of Christianity in China, which is in, at least for me, it's, it's near my desk always as I write. And, uh, and most of us in the field use the, the first and second volume of the handbook uh, uh, as references. Um, but also, I should say, in my own life, I began my, my own studies in Hanxie, in Sinology. So uh, my doctoral work is in the Zhou and Han Dynasty text. And when I personally think of your work, uh, it, it is the work I personally uh, love so much. Because if I think about your last book, Intercultural Weaving of Historical Texts, you constantly refer to the classics. And so I so much enjoy this. Uh, I, I, I enjoy the Sinological project and I believe in it and you, you definitely uphold that. Well, uh, but our aim is to hear from you. So let me just begin. We're asking every scholar the same questions. Uh, maybe at the end, I'll ask you one additional question. But, but, uh, but Nicholas, could you tell us then what brought you to the field of China Christianity studies? And, and even maybe add to that, why are you interested in the particular topics that you research? Yeah, uh, thank you in the first place for this uh, very nice occasion to share with you and with the other uh, people about the research. And uh, you mentioned the Leuven School. I would not dare to call it a school, but you already mentioned nicely. I mean, it's not the work of only of one person, but of uh, a group of persons that eh? you have the Dink, with whom I have been working together for a long time, Noel Golfers. I have my colleagues like uh, Karine Fort, who is more in classical studies, with whom I discuss very often, and then quite a number of doctoral students. So it's always a kind of interaction with other people who have contributed to the research. Now, if I um, uh, reflect on the question, how, what brought me to this field, um, in fact, my major interest maybe is not the uh, China Christianity studies, but is the contact between cultures. Mm -hmm. So when I was in Leiden, I was studying in Leiden in the Netherlands, I followed some classes of anthropology in the second year, and there were books on intercultural contacts. And at the same time, I had the classes also of Erich Zürcher on Buddhism and the reception of Buddhism in China, and then Christianity in China with the Jesuits. The main focus was on the understanding of the context between cultures. And that's, in fact, my very simple question that I tried to understand in the last 30 or 40 years, which is, what happens when two cultures meet each other? And in order to yeah, solve, not solve, but understand that question, I need the laboratory. And the laboratory is uh, China and Europe. <coughs> China and Europe in the 17th and the 18th century. And within that frame, I try to understand and to 
let's say, to, um, to see what happens in very different fields. My first study was on Yang Ting Yun, that was more, let's say, philosophical or theological. A Chinese who was educated as what we would say a Confucian scholar. He was a Buddhist, he became a Christian when he was more than 50 years old. And how does it fit together or not together and what happens, you see? And then the next stage was in fact the compilation of the Handbook of Christianity in China. 25 people participated in it. And that was a kind of very broad view to try to understand the, the broader question. Now, within that book, you can say about every topic is discussed, uh, astronomy, mathematics, canon, theology, uh, communities as well, except the most important one, which is ritual. And when we were compiling that book, we said we need, in fact, a chapter on liturgy and on ritual. If we do that, we really have to st understand what is ritual in the 16th, 17th century China, and we will never finish our handbook. So we took it out, and that was then the next research topic, where together with other people, we worked on confession, on, um, on dances. I first worked on dances in order to understand what were, was rituality and ritual dances in China in the 17th century which had nothing to do with Christianity in the first place. You see. Um, and uh, funerals and marriage and uh, the mass and, and so on. You see. Then I have been looking at images and visuality with a book on um, the Chinese life of Christ. Then I have been working on this um, uh, textual history eh, and the historiography, the book that you mentioned, and at this moment, I am working again with other people on print culture. So how does the circulation of books that was so characteristic of what happened with this exchange in the 17th century, namely these missionaries arrived in China, and there was already a print culture available, and they had nothing to learn or to teach the Chinese about print culture. Moreover, there was no pre-printing uh, censorship, so they immediately could publish what they wanted. You see. So, and how does this circulation of books and text, because it's the mission that produced the largest amount of text compared to Latin America, Japan, uh, India, and so on, at the same time, built also community. So that's basically the major, my major interest. So how through intercultural contacts, we can understand the question of contacts between culture, at the same time, understand hopefully better China. That's also something what I learned from, from Eric Zerger, he used to say, we can look at the culture itself, which we do regularly, but we can also see how a culture reacts to another culture. Then you reveal something of yourself that you would not have revealed if you did not met, meet the other, you see. And, um, and so that's the typical sinological work that I always like to do. Uh, so you mentioned um, this historiography. I've been working on this Kantian text, and it's true, and the dances. Now I'm working on uh, the, the gazettes and so, so which are very typically sinological issues, you see, which I like. But the ultimate question is maybe not even to understand China, but is simply to understand humanity. So to understand what is humanity through these different topics, you see. So that's more or less my answer to the first uh, question. You know, uh, 
when people have uh, discussed your work, one thing that is quite constantly conjured is your remarks about cultural encounter. And that is an especially cultural encounter in what you refer to as these sort of liminal spaces or interstitial spaces. Um, and and, 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 and uh, thinking too about um, uh, this next question, which has to do with maybe something that caused you to think differently. In the field of Christianity uh, in China, scholars have recently discussed this transition from a field that wrote about missionaries to a field that writes now about Chinese Christianity, not about European Christianity in China, but Chinese Christianity. And um, that represents, a, in a way, a, a, a shift. Um, but so the, the next question is, have you ever had a research discovery or was there ever a moment in your reading of texts or thinking about Christianity in China that changed your way of thinking about this history? Yeah. So I think it's really a question of methodology that I'm most interested in and that shifted and that continues to shift, you see. So um, when I studied in Leiden, the major approach was to look at Chinese sources and to see how was Christianity or was European thought received in China. And so that's a bit the Yang Tingyun approach of book, you see. But then uh, that continued. And I think the next major step is when I studied also philosophy. Uh, partly in Paris, so I'm also, let's say, influenced by the kind of French philosophy about authority. And there, let's say, to make it extremely simple, but also very essential, is when we, it's about the, the uh, let's say, the philosophy of the self and the other. So when we speak, we are in a, in a society where we speak about the self, and we have to be self, and I have to be myself, and I have to have self-banking and self-study, and I have a cell phone uh, to take selfies, and so everything is the self, you see. And that the whole point is that what is first? Is first the self and then the other, or is the first the other and then the self? Or to make it more complicated, is the essence not in the encounter? In other words, that the self um, yeah, becomes what he becomes through the encounter with the other. So the self is shaped by the other. And this happens in the in betweenness, in the interaction. So this is maybe a bit complicated, but to say it in another word, yeah, it's not only I become myself by saying what I want to be. But I meet other people and they often reveal to me who I am and they make me to become myself because I encounter the other. To make it historically, because the point is if that approach is correct so that we are shaped by the others, this has an enormous consequence on our writing of history of intercultural contacts. So, Ricci, when we talk about Ricci, we are always talking, and Ricci went to China, and he translated mathematics, and he did this and that and that, you see. So it is as if only Ricci is the agent. But it was the quest of the others, and he had the world map in his room, and Shi Quang Chi came there and said, what is all this? So the quest comes from the other. And, and then he said, yes, but these lines, I can explain that to you, but I have to write a letter to Clavius to ask some more books. So he asked the books to Clavius, that took a few years, and then he comes back. But you see, in the end, if Ricci became who he became, it's because he encountered the other, like Shi Quang Chi and so on, you see. And in fact, this also is written in the first history of church book, which are the Acts of the Apostles. And so in the Acts of the Apostles, you first have the community in Jerusalem, and then they are persecuted and they go away. And then you have this famous chapter 10, 11 of uh, Cornelius and Peter. 
And so the story usually goes, Peter is taking a siesta and then he, uh, there is a sheet coming down and uh, with all these reptiles and so, and there is a voice saying, take and eat, you see. And then he goes to um, uh, Joppa and, um, and there he meets Cornelius and he converts Cornelius and the family. But uh, Luke, who is the first church historian, did not write a story like that. He started in Joppa, where Cornelius has a dream. And he sends two people to Caesarea, where Peter is, at the moment where he had his uh, vision. And they invite him to go to Joppa. You see. And then the whole family gets the Holy Spirit, independent of Peter. So it's the conversion also of Peter, you see. And so you see there very clearly that the agent is in the first place the other, you see. And so when we write the history of intercultural context, but also the history of, let's say, of Christianity, how can we start from the other and take the quest, the other as an as a agent, where it starts from, you see. And then, of course, this is still in an intercultural aspect. So it's not only about, let's say, Chinese, Chinese Christianity. It is about Chinese who are Christians and who encounter others, Chinese, foreigners, because this foreign aspect is essential in Christianity. We are not, Christianity is not the accumulation of nationalist uh, uh, forms of Christianity. It is always in this in-betweenness, which is not sure, which is not clear, which is, but it's in between that the things uh, happen. And so, and it arrives in many of these words, interaction, interstices. And so the inter is the in-between. So this is, let's say, yeah, the major research discovery that helps me to try to understand what happened. Um, one, one, th th that was a very rich answer. And, and I think that what comes to my mind as we transition to the next question is, at least in this, on this continent, North America, we very frequently read Edward Said who obviously uh, was a very, he popularized in many senses the, the word self and other. But in Saeed's writing, he discusses an imperialistic use of the phrase, right? The, the self imperial, it sort of uh, colonizes the other. You've reframed it and reframed it in a way where the self and the other, you've reframed it into a moment of encounter that actually uh, discusses and thinks about understanding and transformation, how both are transformed. This is something that, um, that many, many scholars have enjoyed about your rethinking of this idea of self and other. But, but th this really does lead us into the next question, which is- uh, but Maybe just to, to, just to respond still to that, mm. but to, because that helps me to clarify even mm. more, because on one hand, I think yeah, uh, Said certainly made a, an enormous contribution to to show how our vision on the other can also depend on our own vision and how we construct that. Eh? So I also respect that. But the problem with that approach can be, I don't say that it's always like that, but can be that in the end, you do not sufficiently respect the other as other. Mm. And you see there the French approach with people like Levinas and other thinkers, which are not so much translated into English, in fact, they are also very, very difficult to translate yeah? because Levinas is really very difficult. But the point is really, yeah, the other as an other that is not, that cannot be reduced to my construction of the other. That's the, that's the essential point in it, you see. 
right? I, here in this country, we read, we read more of, about previous French thinkers who conjure the idea of la mission civilisatrice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Levin, oh, yeah, yeah. Levinas, of course, we, we also read him, but uh, we need to read him more. I agree. Well, let me ask you the next question then, because it really does move us into the realm of encounter. And I know that I have uh, myself met with you in, in China during conferences, uh, which was just so enjoyable for me. But, but the question we're asking then is, it, can you describe a particular moment or maybe more than one moment wherein you've experienced something in China that has been particularly meaningful to you? Well, I think uh, what I like most, I mean, on one hand, you work at home and you try to do the textual research and so on. And then you can go to China and you can share and receive also, because sharing is always receiving, uh, the, 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 the fruits of your research and uh, receive also the fruits of the research of the others, especially with uh, colleagues and young scholars, you see. So that's what I enjoy most is yeah, to be in China and yeah, to uh, meet all these enthusiastic young scholars and to be with them and uh, let's say help them and, uh, and receive from them and uh, getting in changes and so on. That's, I think, what I like most. Um, the other experience in China is also, yeah, and I'll come back on that a bit later, is the arti artisanal side of our work, which becomes more and more dif difficult because yeah, we can always go to online and find all kinds of things online. But when I was in China in the 80s, with, uh, 1982, 83, yeah, you had to go by bike three quarters of an hour or one hour longer than that to a library and you had to copy your text by hand. There were no photocopies. <laughs> and every time I go to China, I take an occasion to go to libraries and to find things that I cannot find here and that you find, don't find online. So the simple artisanal work of looking at texts, copying texts, by hand in the library, you see. And that's, there you share the same life as so many great Chinese scholars that I admire. And when, when we read a text, I mean, the best people in our field, that's what they have been doing, you see. And in very difficult circumstances. But I can share, yeah, I, I can say that I share also that life, you see. Just, just go to the library early in the morning. <laughs> you have to get out of it at 11 because there is the lunch and wait and whatever. And, and then so on. Uh, and then the final thing, but that's maybe not only in China, I think what is so enjoyable is all these uh, small discoveries. You see. Uh, one of the things I really like to do is you have a Western text that is translated into Chinese, but you don't know who, what is the original text. And we have plenty of these examples. And the other way around, you have Chinese, uh, Western uh, European texts that are translation of Chinese texts. And we know what they are about, but we don't know what is the original Chinese text. And so, yeah, sometimes it takes two weeks, half a year. I have a pile of things that I still want to find and it can take years, you see. And so once you have found it, very often by uh, serendipity, yeah, that's great. Absolutely great that you find uh, some text. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's the text, that's the original. So, uh, yeah, you know, um, I too have been in archives where they do not allow photocopy yeah. and have had to handwrite. 
In fact, I've handwritten entire books in Chinese. Exactly. And I also... think my, um, my Chinese handwriting has greatly improved. <laughs> it's greatly improved, but yes, yes. Well, you know, you, you, you mentioned Chinese scholars. We're asking every scholar, of course, we want to hear most about you, but we're asking every scholar to reflect upon a pleasant memory or a significance that another scholar has had upon you. Um, it could be more than one scholar, but is there something about another scholar that you think in our field we should remember? Well, you will not be surprised. It's in fact my uh, supervisor, Eric Zürcher. <laughs> uh, I, I don't like to speak about influence because he always respected me and I respected him and it's not a question of influence. But I think he has, uh, it means a lot to the field, you see. Uh, so Eric Zürcher, he has, in his whole career, he wrote two books and 60 articles and half the one book the first one was about buddhism and his last publication which was celebrated a few months before he died was the book of the cultural ritual on christianity in china his 30 articles 30 are about buddhism 30 are about christianity and half of his work was after his retirement so there is still a lot of uh, hope for uh, our work after retirement. Uh, but I think, yeah, Zürcher, because he was interested in Chinese religiosity, in trying to understand that, some of these basic insights, so that, yeah, a kind of the do with this, uh, he always said, does it work or does it not work? And if it works, will believe or follow it and if it doesn't work they change and so I got some of these basic insights he has this whole concept of um, cultural imperative eh, where he looks at what he called marginal religions which is Buddhism Christianity Judaism coming into China and how does Confucianism eh, I mean, with all prudence, we have to have uh, on using that word. Eh? But what is I think, the, 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 the cultural imperative of that Chinese culture towards these religions? So these are some of the basic, basic insights. Um, and at the same time, he, he did all this precise work of which text is where uh, I still have some of his notes and I looked at them recently. I mean, and he does all this with his beautiful handwriting. And it is, uh, so when I um, uh, was, I had written my PhD, but I had to wait uh, before correction. And so, so I worked for a few months in Leiden and I continued, uh, let's say, bibliography that was started by him you see. and then uh, sometime later Abdudink worked on that and in the end it grew it grew and it became yeah what is now the CCT database you see but all this goes back on yeah the the foundation that was laid by by him you see. so I think we are very very grateful for what they did uh, I think, like always, some of the ideas you could contest or you could not agree or whatever, but that's normal, you see. It's much more the inspiration and to look broader, a wider perspective, uh, some very nice insights, but always com com combined with this very, very precise work. And the fact that he, yeah, that to translate and annotate the whole book or a child is just incredible. How many scholars can do that today? <laughs> I mean, it's a very good translation and yeah, nobody can now submit a proposal to say, I want to make a translation of such a book, you see. 
because they say, what's the big theory behind it? Right. So, uh, so that's, that's the, the scholar I, I mentioned. There, there are two. Really pleasure, I personally, think, but also for the whole field. I think there are two reasons, just to think about your, your, your statement about translation. At least in this country, uh, we have too many meetings <laughs> to translate well. And then second, it, translations do not count for tenure, uh, very sadly. So it's always the monograph with some interwoven theory that gets one tenure. So, well, I, you know, I should say about Eric Zerker, many people have thought that, that one of the most significant things that he did for the intellectual community is that with Jacques Gernet's sort of theory of impossibility, Eric Zerker wrote and, and provided a, a theory for um, exchange and symbiosis. So the, the so-called Gernet theory, we finally moved away from it because of your uh, doctoral advisor. And of course your work I think continues in that, in that vein. But we, we have one more sort of official question and then I have an additional question. But Nicholas, could you tell us a, a little bit about what, and, and this question seems a bit hackneyed, I think, but, but it's a question that many young scholars want to know. And of course, I should say to you that the reason, one of the reasons this series uh, was envisioned was the death of Gary Tiedemann and the death of Daniel Bayes uh, and many, many scholars uh, communicated that, oh, we need to have an interview series to preserve the ideas, the voices really, of some of the scholars globally at this moment. But, um, but, but young scholars have requested that we ask, especially those who have published uh, quite a bit, what are your hopes for the future of those who study Sino-Western or Sino-Christian exchange? So, yeah, in fact, my major hope are the young people themselves. <laughs> so, uh, and so my advice I'd like to give to them, yeah, work hard and seriously. <laughs> you have to chukhu a little bit, you see. Life now, we want to have immediate results and quickly and, uh, and no, but you have to get into the text, do serious learn and work, try to learn languages, um, uh, go to the libraries, uh, read things profoundly. So that's the only way because, yeah, the temptation is to be superficial uh, and uh, quickly and so on. And uh, on a short term, that works, but not on a long term, you see. And related to that, um, and that's yeah, related to the study of Christianity in China, um, is uh, to pay attention to the history of the margins. Uh, in the sense that in a classical Chinese book, on the top margin, sometimes you find some notes and sometimes printed notes and in the European books of the 17th century, you have the main page, and then on the side you have some margin some, with some text, and in the text you have some summary or some, some explanation or whatever. And this often highlights the main text. So in a certain way, the study of Christianity says something about Chinese culture, society, and so on itself. Because you study the margins, and within Christianity in China, you have different groups that are in margins. It's not a negative term, but they are often neglected. I'm very happy that there are now more and more serious studies on women in Chinese Christianity. Because they are the foundation of the Christian church. Uh, the, the, of course, the, the missionaries are in the, in the center of the, of the light and then you have the, the priest or whatever, but those who always maintained it, continued the, the ritual, I call them the ritual agents. 
who transmit their rituals in the family, in the community, and so on, the women, you see. And now we start to have very, very good studies about them, you see. So for young people, go and search for this kind of topics, you see. And at the same time, so then to the broader topic of contacts between cultures, yeah, try to understand what is going on. There are so many fields that um, can continue to be investigated. You see. So many interesting topics. Try to find something original, you see, without, without only stressing originality, you see. It's more, uh, it's more uh, the depth, you see. In, in my department, I use to use or Vs in my own language, but the first is that we use our imagination. You see. That's the first thing. The second is that we, uh, through our research, we are somehow dislocated or displaced because it's the other and also the subject that we study that displaces us. And the, the third one is the depth what we need to do is depth, depth, depth. You see. It's a bit uh, against the, the globalized superficiality of all the media. You see. Go into depth, you see. And then the last word is the connection, you see, or the encounters. And it's true, the, if you do the previous things, then you can really encounter. And so, you see, Many of these topics are not, not only the subject of our research, but we become subject of it um, uh, through doing this research. In other words, uh, it's not only that I study encounters, this research helps me to encounter people, helps me to be put, to be displaced, helps me to be in, in, in the in-between and in the interaction. It leads to interaction, you see. So that's... Uh, oh, I, I'm happy you mentioned the, the issue of women. I rather like Nadine Almsler's recent book uh, on uh, yeah, the exactly. idea of matriarchs. And we all know, I think, that yeah. without Candida Shu, the Jesuit mission would have struggled. Yeah. She was a foundational supporter of the Jesuit mission. Um, and I'm also glad that you mentioned chirku, eating bitterness, because uh, we all know that working through texts can be <laughs> extremely can, can be extremely bitter sometimes. Yeah. Um, well, th then let me just ask you one additional question that is uh, kind of a request, and that is we the, the rumor is you're working on print culture. You mentioned that earlier. It's become yeah. an extremely popular topic. Joachim Kurtz has been working on print culture, certainly uh, in, 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 in this country. Um, uh, uh, we have scholars who have been very interested in this topic. But in the question of print culture, you have Ching, you have obviously uh, Ricci and Eleni and all of these people who are producing texts, including Chinese, Xu Guangqi. But there's also the Republican era. So um, I wonder if, if by way of a final answer, if you could tell us specifically or say a, say a little bit more about what you're thinking about as you approach the topic of print culture. Yeah, so it's, it's always a kind of uh, mixed subject because on one hand I really want to understand what was print culture in China at that time. And on the other hand I want to see the interaction you see. So so I will I will say what what I'm the topics that I'm searching on and preparing some publication. The first thing is how did print culture, let's say the Christian, uh, in the broad sense of the word, eh, because it also involves um, uh, techno te technological mathematical works and so on. So basically, all the books that are in the database, how did that evolve in the course of 200 years. And this by focusing on the, what one can call the church publications. 
So the question is, where were books published at what time? And was there an evolution of that in the course of 200 years? Uh, in China, you have some court or official publications. You have so-called commercial publishers. I speak about 17th and 18th century. You also have some private, very, very important, the private publications. And you also have, let's say, the temple publications. And these are the major groups. Okay, and, and the, 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 the percentages are different from for each. But you also have yeah, the Christian publications in the churches. And the churches are, let's say, residences. They are, let's say, semi-private houses and chapels that are linked to a, to a, to a private house. I mean, certainly in the beginning. So what we did, and I did, did one, this is also in uh, digital humanities. Eh? I had a student who, um, who, after Synology, she went into digital humanities, and then she had to do some work. And I said, Let, let's do some to, together and let us try to visualize that. So we are preparing a publication on the visualization of the evolution mm -hmm. over 200 years. And on one hand, I think it really contributes to uh, the understanding of print culture in China uh, because there are no studies, as far as I know, about, for instance, temple publications like that, that look at this evolution. And at the same time, we see also how this whole print culture in Christianity evolved. Uh, sometimes it was in the center of the country, then it was in Fujian, then there were displacements, and it's fascinating. You see. So that's one, that is one of the topics. Uh, I mean, let's say, I hope in a few months that we are finished with that, uh, that publication. So this is about the production, you see. Production. And, ne and next point is the distribution. How was it distributed? And there, I had already an article in 82, and then we, together with then Adoni, uh, we rewrote that in something like 95 or 97. Uh, and this is simply all this kind of extremely basic work. Check in the private, the catalogs of private libraries from the 17th century, whether there are books about seen in Western culture. Context. Did a scholar of whom we still have the private library, did he have a copy of the Tian Shu Shi or the Tian Shu Zhao Yao or whatever? So you see what you have to do is very simple. You take these books and you go line by line mm -hmm. until you see one of these texts you see. So um, we did that for about 15 texts or so. Uh, at that time, and then there was a new book, and so we had more. And now we have many more publications in that time, uh, in, in, in that line. So last year I checked about 20 more. I think we are at about 34 uh, bibliographic catalogs of private libraries mm -hmm. from uh, 1600 until 1800 to check on these books. Who had these books, how many were these books, how were they spread, was the regional spread, but also under how did they classify the books. Because when you have a Chinese book that comes in European or in an American library, the whole question is where are you going to put it? If you have the I Ching, is that a philosophical work? Is that a Chinese classical work? Is that, uh, is that a work on, uh, let's say, um, uh, um, divination or in the future or whatever you see? So, 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 and so it disturbs, books disturb the classification. And this also has happen, happened in China, you see. So that's one of the topics that we see. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing on which I'm working now, so I was thinking when I was doing this research, 
I was wondering, yeah, you have the so-called Chinese cassette at the Tipao, or in the 19th century, 19th century, the Tipao. So uh, then it was called the Peking Gazette, but not before, you see. And I was just wondering, did the missionaries, always simple questions, eh? you start from the simple questions, did the missionaries read the Gazette? So I thought, oh, that will be easily answered because the answer will be more or less no and maybe a little bit. And I start, I wanted to do, finish that research in two weeks and I'm busy with it now for two years, you see. So, and that will be uh, a book, you see, only on uh, the use of gazettes in the Kangxi, Yongcheng, and Qianlong uh, uh, period, you see. So, and it's absolutely fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I mean, so, not only by these missionaries, but uh, uh, the, the, the Enlightenment thinkers, they read directly the translation of the cassettes by the missionaries, and that's where they got their inspiration for their ideas, you see. And so far that in the Encyclopédie de Diderot, eh, the famous Encyclopédie de Diderot, there is a lemma, there is a, an article on Gazette, and that was written by Voltaire. Mm -hmm. And Voltaire writes, yes, we are talking about Gazette, but you know, the Chinese had already a Gazette long before Europe. You see. Mm -hmm. So, and these are the things that I'm busy with. I mean, this is my, my own research because I have also doctoral students working on several uh, topics. And, and when I say, yeah, my own research, it's always in collaboration with others because I exchanged with some young Chinese scholars about it, and uh, it's most enjoyable. So that's that's the latest uh, topic, yeah. Yeah, you, I, I, re the... I, I recall. I think it was in Hangzhou. Uh, you were you you mentioned. I think it was Hangzhou. Could have been Kaifeng. Anyway, um, you you described the project of line by line work as uh, stamp collecting. Yes, and. Uh, uh, I really appreciate that because uh, that really is the the academic the sinological project is the sometimes it's not very glamorous sometimes we are only looking for a, a book title on a list but it it really does congeal into something very significant and um well let me so so really we're we're at the end of our interview um I I, I want to sort of close with one remark and. and and I'm remembering something I read in Mengzi. I, I was in Taiwan. We were taking a course on Mencius. And there was a passage where uh, Mencius reflected on how, how much he appreciated books from the past. I think he even said it, his best friends were the authors from the past. And uh, frequently, uh, Nicholas, you pro perhaps know this, we read a book that is very influential or it, it's a very... Uh, uh, transformative but we don't we never have an opportunity to say thank you to the author so I want to personally take this moment to thank you for your work it, in my office my home office just behind me I'm at school just behind me is the Nicholas Standart collection of <laughs> books so this is a for me a special opportunity to say thank you for your contribution for your ideas uh, for all of the stamp collecting that you have done. And, and then also you mentioned uh, Zerker's productivity after retirement. So I, I, I think I will have to empty a shelf for after you retire for to expand the Nicholas Standard collection. <laughs> but Nicholas, Professor Standard, thank you again for agreeing to be interviewed. What a joy it was to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a real joy for me as well. Yeah. I wish the, the, the best to all the young scholars. That's the most important. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh.